qualitatively different from other wooden self bows. In fact, the bows from Waterford are essentially identical to later medieval longbow in all respects except length, and any attempt to distinguish the longbow from other wooden self bows purely on the ground of length must always be entirely arbitrary and unsustainable. Now, there are two main problems with this quotation, however, and in exploring them, will make clear why the longbow should be considered as a distinct weapon and what its capabilities were. The first is that while the Waterford bows were indeed proportionally similar to later longbows, they're far from essentially identical in absolute thickness or width. The most complete Waterford bow is about two and a half centimeters wide and two centimeters thick, which is about 29% narrower and 37% thinner than the median weapon of the three Mary Rose bows in the Royal Armors. Now that may not sound like that much, but it matters a lot because the strength of the bow, which is to say the amount of resistance it puts up to being bent, and therefore the amount of energy that is stored when it is drawn, and therefore more or less the amount of energy it imparts to the arrow when the arrow is released, increases proportionally with the width, but increases proportionally with the cube of the thickness. So in other words, if you double the thickness, you have eight times as much difficulty pulling it and eight times as much capacity to store energy. That means that entirely aside from the issue of length, a Mary Rose longbow would have more than five times the energy storage capacity of a short bow like the Waterford bow. Second, despite what you may have heard or read in other contexts, length does matter. <laughs> The basic reason for the length of the bow is mattering is that uh, the length of the draw matters. The longer the draw, the farther you pull back the arrow under pressure, the more energy you store because you're exerting the force all the time you're pulling. And the farther you're pulling, the more energy you're putting in, and the longer the arrow is pushed forward by the string until it's released. With a straight bow like the long bow, the force required to pull back the bow, as you see on the, uh, the force to draw curves on the right there, uh, actually curves upward. It increases the farther you go, so that each inch that you pull is a little more difficult to pull than the previous inch. And that means that um, it stores a lot more than proportionally more energy with a longer draw. The farther the, that a bow is drawn, the more it has to curve, the, the greater the curve of the arc has to be, as you see in the example on the left, where you have a short bow, four feet, and a six foot bow. The short bow, both drawn to the same distance, the short bow is bent much more, it's curved much more. And obviously, the farther, if you think about you know, holding a stick and bending it, you bend it to a certain point and it, and it breaks. So the bowyer's rule of thumb is that for a, a thick self bow, it has to be, it should be at least 2.2 2 times as long as the arrow is supposed to loose. If you have a somewhat thinner, wider bow, uh, you can extend that a little bit, but it should still be at length, at least double the length of its arrows, uh, and, and therefore of the draw that it, it can sustain. Thus, as we would expect, the arrows of the Waterford bow, which was about a third shorter than a Mary Rose bow, were about a third shorter than the Mary Rose arrows only about 24 inches long for about a 22 inch draw. And using a, a thick bow like a long bow or like a waterford bow in its own proportion, it is only possible to do a full draw to the ear, which is how the long bow was drawn, with a bow that is at least as tall as the archer. If the bow is shorter than that, you can only draw up to the chin. Everybody stand up for a second. I want y'all to try this out. Draw like you're drawing a bow and draw to your chin. You might have to chin. Right? Or your eye, either way. Okay? And now pull back all the way to your ear. See how that goes quite a bit farther back. That means when you release the arrow, the strain pushes the arrow further forward and you get more velocity. And not just a little bit more velocity, either. A six-foot bow uh, drawn 32 inches, which is what you see in the blue triangle, the energy stored by that is in the area under the curve. And uh, a six-foot bow drawn to 32 inches will store about two and a half times 
as much energy as an equally stiff, equally thick, four-foot bow drawn to 24 inches, which is the farthest you can safely draw. So the longbow stores a lot more power than the short bow. Despite all this, one cannot really say that the longbow was a better weapon than the short bow, any more than one can say that in World War II, a Browning automatic rifle was a better weapon than an M1 carbine. Outside England, short bows continued to be the norm for archers in the 15th and 16th centuries after the, long, the capabilities of the longbow had been demonstrated. That shows that there was a choice being made, that, they had a, that bowyers and, and archers had a reason to prefer the short bow over the long bow, that the short bow had some advantages. It was cheaper. Um, yew actually became a very expensive wood. It takes, it's a very, very slow growing tree, and it was in huge demand because of the demand for English longbows and whole areas of Spain and the Alps where they grew this slow growing yew basically became deforested, and the price of bows went pretty high. Uh, the short bow, and this is an important one, was much handier for carrying around in wooded areas uh, and using for hunting. And by far, though, the biggest advantage of the short bow is that normal people can use them. Right? If you put me on a battlefield and give me a choice of a real longbow or a short bow, I'll take the short bow because all I could do with the longbow is hit somebody over the head there. Uh, whereas I could draw a short bow. I'm not strong enough to draw a, a bow that requires 110 or 120 pound draw weight. To use a longbow, you have to be like the archers described by Dominic Mancini in the late 15th century as having, quote, bodies stronger than other people's and hands and arms of iron. But that large advantage for the short bow is dispensed with in my uh, thesis that I'm trying to defend here by my caveat in the hands of a skilled archer. For an archer with the strength and skill to use it, a long bow was a far more effective weapon than the short bow. There are four main characteristics to take into account to assess the effectiveness of this weapon. Its rate of fire, its accuracy, its range, and its terminal effects or capacity to inflict damage on the target. The rate of fire for the longbow or shortbow is basically the same. A longbow is somewhat more accurate than a shortbow, even at short ranges, uh, because it has a smoother release with less hand shock, but it's only a minor advantage. But in the other two characteristics, uh, there is no comparison. Because of the much greater energy it could impart to the arrow, a longbow can far surpass a short bow in range and impact on the target, including the ability to penetrate armor. With a moderate weight flight arrow, as modern tests have shown, a longbow can consistently shoot out to about 350 yards. By contrast, a well-made well Navajo bow of a bit under four feet and very similar thickness and width and just general shape to the Waterford bow that was tested by Sackton Pope cast an arrow only 150 yards, 350 versus 150. That's a, and that 150 yards is typical of uh, Native American and other Aboriginal bows that have been tested. The longbow had a tremendous advantage in the impact energy of its arrows as well. This was important for long range shooting because even a short bow might be plenty powerful enough to kill a person or a deer at short range, but it loses energy as it goes. Uh, and so it's good to have extra energy. But it's of absolutely crucial importance when your target is armored. A knight fully protected uh, by strong mail over a padded gambeson, and even more so if he was wearing a plate, was almost invulnerable to arrows shot from a wooden short bow, or indeed from many composite short bows. Uh, most, uh, numerous tests have demonstrated that, by contrast, an arrow from a long bow, even a longbow weaker than the weakest of the ones found on the Mary Rose would send a warrior right through mail armor, even at long uh, ranges. And let me just particularly emphasize on oh, my I think I'm a little bit messed up here, but this is the back of this shirt which was shot with longbow arrows. This is an actual steel riveted mail shirt, and these are the arrowheads that have pierced the front, gone through, broken the armor in the back, and come out the far side. 